I call a meeting to order of the Veterans and Military Affairs Finance and Policy Committee. And if, if you all would please join me in standing and pledging allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and we have the minutes for February. the uh, February 20, <laughs> February 13th meeting. Uh, Representative Bliss, would you like to move? So moved, Mr. Chair. Uh, are there any comments to the minutes? Any corrections? Okay, uh, seeing none, all in favor of moving the uh, minutes, uh, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Take care of that. Um, Representative Coulter, if you'd like to come up and present your bill, please. Okay, Representative Coulter, if you would uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with uh, moving your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Representative Nathan Coulter, and uh, I am honored to be here presenting House File 2130. Um, and I want to start off by saying that I'm really, truly grateful for the bipartisan support uh, that this bill has received, both in, in this body with the, the chair and Representative Weems, his co-author, um, as well as uh, the this, this Senate. Um, so House File 2130 would provide a direct appropriation from the general fund to the Department of Veterans <coughs> Affairs, um, the purpose of which would be to provide a grant to the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum. <coughs> the appropriation would be $600,000 each year for a total of $1.2 million this biennium. Um, and this would cover costs related to staffing to provide direct services for veterans and their families. Uh, as I'm sure you all know, the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum is located just outside of Little Falls, directly on the base at Camp Ripley. Um, and for more than 40 years, the museum has relied on a small number of staff funded primarily by private donations. As I'm sure many of you also know, uh, the museum is in the process of a significant expansion and relocation. Um, and in order to ensure that the museum can continue to serve Minnesotans, and in, in particular, of course, uh, veterans and their families, uh, they are seeking this funding. Uh, so with me today is Randall Dietrich, who is the Executive Director of the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum, uh, and he will explain further uh, the, need, the need for this funding. Mr. D Dietrich, welcome. Uh, please identify yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon. Randall Dietrich, Executive Director of the Minnesota Military and Veterans Museum at Camp Ripley. Chair Newton, members, I appreciate the chance to speak with you this afternoon. The museum uh, has been a special place in the hearts uh, of veterans and their families uh, for decades, and they continue to seek us out uh, for their help uh, with photographs and uniforms, uh, to share their stories, to find their friends, and to see themselves in the company of other world-class veterans. When you come through the front door at our museum at Camp Ripley, there's a very good chance you'll be greeted by our archivist or curator or our director at the front desk. This personal connection is something that we take very seriously uh, and is in many ways humbling uh, to, to have veterans of all walks of life, of all ages, uh, come through our door and ask us questions about their service uh, or ask us uh, to, to accept a piece into, the, into our collection. Uh, it's terribly humbling. Uh, we had a, a veteran over Veterans Day uh, back in November uh, whose family had lined up a meeting. Uh, he was sadly on his way to hospice and his last stop was to come to the museum and, and donate some items that belonged to him and his father who'd fought in World War II. Um, so it's a humbling experience to be there. Uh, I argue we provide an invaluable service to the veterans community, uh, being a place that always has our doors open for veterans and service them literally every single day of the year. We're also that happy to host uh, school groups all year long. Uh, in this case, a school group got to meet a World War II 100-year-old veteran, Fred Topple and also uh, hosts things like uh, the recent Norwegian exchange up at Camp Ripley. But 
uh, with new opportunities come new challenges. Moving from this campus that you see uh, to a brand new campus off of Highway 371, which is still part of Camp Ripley. Uh, new challenges come with these new opportunities, which is why I'm speaking with you today. Uh, most pressing uh, is the handful of staff currently um, have moved well beyond the walls of Camp Ripley and their day-to-day -day support of veterans, their families, and, and the general public uh, for, to more of a statewide effort to mobilize many in support of this much larger opportunity to inspire and educate that this building affords us. This push has necess necessitated an increase in hours of some museum positions and the addition of new ones. State bonding dollars uh, are expected to cover construction of this Camp Ripley facility that you see on the screen. And the Museum Board of Directors has committed raising $10 million to complete the indoor spaces of this 40,000 square foot facility, the classrooms, the archives and collection spaces, the gallery, the theater. Now we seek to enlist a team of veterans, veteran volunteers to lend a hand in pulling us all together. This collaborative work and what results from it will enable us to showcase the stories of Minnesota veterans coming together in a common cause that you see on the screen. A few examples of this mobilization effort that we already have underway that we want to accelerate with your help. In this case, uh, a new facility is going to need a platoon of mannequins. And you can buy mannequins, and you've seen them at the new Army Museum out in DC, and you've seen them at the World War II Museum in New Orleans. This happens to be uh, David Geister, a Marine veteran, Minneapolis resident, who's customizing these pieces for us. So again, calling on the Minnesota veteran community to come together to make this happen. Uh, David is one example of that. Another example of that is the, the process of restoring uh, the Stewart tank up in Brainerd. Uh, Larry Oswald and his team there gathering stories of Minnesotans uh, from World War II in the Philippines, the 194th Tank Battalion. Other examples of volunteers coming together to make this happen. Jerry Ryan, a Vietnam veteran, uh, discovered a World War II glider trainer uh, that is now currently being restored, uh, being restored by a group actually in Hutchinson, Minnesota of all places, uh, Classic Arrow, Tim Miller, Jerry Ryan, Matt Hopper, Joshua Miller, John Dews, Andy Nadine, and Joe Chunka uh, are all working on this project together. Again, veterans coming together to outfit this new facility. Other even more elaborate examples, you have a copies of our Allies newsletter in your handouts. Uh, that Allies newsletter uh, chronicles the first step that we took working with Governor Walls to acquire the sail and rudder of the USS Minneapolis St. Paul submarine. Uh, it was transported here via Anderson Trucking, who donated their time. Brooks Berg is a, a Navy veteran himself, again, donating his time, developing a crew of individuals who are going to be restoring uh, that sail and rudder because when it was decommissioned in 2008, the Navy did its part. Uh, and disassemble those pieces, and those pieces need to be restored, reassembled, and installed on a new 40,000 square foot facility uh, at Camp Ripley. So uh, this is a much larger effort, but one that also deserves attention and requires the attention of our staff to go out there and, and build that team to make that happen, while at the same time maintaining our day-to-day -day operations at the museum. One final example, early example I would offer with you is the ongoing work with the National Guard. In this case, uh, the Women on Guard portrait uh, completed by Charles Kapsner. Uh, this new painting that is about to be installed actually at the state capitol effective May 1, for your knowledge and understanding, will eventually find a home uh, at our museum at Camp Ripley in our current space and then in our new space to be developed, uh, which has plans to open in 2025. So this is a crucial 24-month period where we are working hard to convert what you see as concepts, concepts of what will fill this 40,000 square foot facility, move from concepts to completion of all these very unique pieces that tell the story of Minnesota veterans, in many cases built or restored by Minnesota veterans, and that requires a statewide effort to make happen, hence my appearance with you today. House File 2130 will provide the funds needed to foster, maintain, and document the important work of these veteran teams. In doing so, the new museum will showcase 
veteran stories from all service branches, as well as those who rallied to help share stories dating back to the Civil War. It is an approach that is more time intensive, but completely appropriate and important to do so. In closing, uh, talking to uh, Tim Miller, who has a uh, restoration uh, aero classics business, and Hutchinson, who's working on that glider for us. We asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you stepping up, taking the time, um, amidst everything else going on in his life, of course. And he says, projects are fun. We want to make this process of developing this museum fun and involved for the 300,000 veterans in the state of Minnesota. Projects are fun. You rally around them, you come together, you develop something. And he goes on further to say, I'll bring my grandkid to the museum and see, see that glider up there? We helped restore that. And he says, we're happy to do this. We're enthused to be doing this because it's really an honor to work on something other veterans will see and look at. Some, somebody's father is going to be there, and they're going to say to their kid, your grandpa flew in one of those during the war. So I appreciate the chance to speak with you today, and I ask for your support of House File 2130. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dietrich. Uh, is there anyone else in the audience who would like to uh, testify? Are there any questions from, yes, Representative Olson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to, the, to the author of the bill, uh, I'm sure you've been to this museum. I was there. It's a beautiful, wonderful place. Definitely small, uh, needs to be increased in size. But based off of your experience there, would you determine that we should petition the chair of this committee to uh, take a field trip utilizing the uh, committee <laughs> funds? I heard the last time they were up there, they got to ride in a Chinook on their way up there. Yeah. <laughs> so to the testifier or to the testifier and to the author. Uh, <laughs> uh, Representative Coulter, uh, I'll let you, you just start with that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have not actually been to the museum. I, <coughs> I have been to the Little Falls area in the past few years ago, but uh, personally, I've never been there. But I mean, you you hooked me with the the promise of the Chinook, so I uh, I'm not going to make a motion, but I, I certainly would support one. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Dietrich. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Chairman uh, Newton. Uh, uh, just a housekeeping point, which I, I should note, which should even win greater favor. I, I hope for what we shared with you, which is the chance to give 300,000 veterans something to do and contribute to for the benefit of future generations. Um, a, as written, a, a, as a housekeeping note, and defer to the author to help me with this, um, what we're asking for is $600,000 for the entire biennium, so $300,000 a year. Uh, the price just got half as much as you thought it was. It's twice the value, and it was a great return on the investment to start with. So I appreciate your time this afternoon. Okay, thank you. Uh Mr. Chair, I just, I just think it would be a great idea to take a field trip. We could utilize some of those committee funds. It would be excellent. I agree, uh, Representative Olson, and maybe we can uh, hit the, uh, the veterans' homes as well. That's bad. By Chinook. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Waynes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, Representative Coulter and, uh, and Mr. Dietrich. Um, I love seeing the pictures of the tanks and the bastards tank being uh, being in place. That I have not seen that, so I'm looking forward to our field trip up there. Um, can you just give us, by way of numbers, what w with the small? I, I recall the small little museum, and I was back when I was in uniform, donated, became a lifetime member, and really appreciated the mentorship and the growth uh, of of the whole project. Mm -hmm. uh, if you could give me an idea how many per year visit that are not, maybe not military, maybe family members. Rep uh, Mr. Dietrich. Yes, yeah. uh, Chair Newton, uh, Member Waynes, uh, thank you. Uh, right now we uh, entertain about 12,000 people a year uh, within the walls of Camp Ripley, uh, and that's been going on for more than 40 years. And so the chance to be outside along Highway 371, that heavily trafficked corridor between here and the Brainerd Lakes area, uh, again, with the support of Camp Ripley to make all that happen, um, we'll see att attendance skyrocket. You can see the, the submarine there um, when Brooks Berg and the, the Navy team is done with restoration. Uh, that's, that's what our, our concept is, that people be, be able to see from the highway. So we're really encouraged to have the chance to, to show this and for so many people to see it uh, along the highway. That's a very prominent space, of course, and uh, it's always been a bit of an obstacle for us being inside the wall of Camp Ripley. Uh, 
general public not knowing that they are indeed welcome to come in and see this public museum. Uh, we all are open year round. Uh, in this case, moving out here will be a game changer. Uh, it's a chance for the state of Minnesota, I would suggest, to really rally around this one time opportunity to build a building from the ground up dedicated solely to Minnesota veterans. Good, thank you. And Mr. Chair, Representative Weens. And, and Mr. Dietrich, thank, thank you so much for that, because that was my, my next question. What do you think it's going to be? And, of course, you, you don't know, but there's an estimate. But you've made the access more accessible uh, for, for the general public, and I think that's a, that's a great move. Uh, I love seeing the, uh, the inner service uh, camar camar camaraderie with this, but remember, it's go Army, beat Navy. That's all I've got to say. And give my regards to Captain Brooks Burke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My Any other questions, oh, sorry. comments? Uh, seeing none, uh, Representative Coulter renews his motion uh, that House File 2130 uh, be laid over for consideration on the later. Thank you. And now I'm going to turn the meeting over to uh, uh, Vice Chair Elkins. Vice Chair Elkins, yeah. And I'm just wondering if I should go up there with all this stuff or, yeah. Anyhow, you got the gavel. I'll go up. Yep. Yes. So our next bill today is House File 1937. This is the uh, budget, uh, the, the governor's budget bill for the Department of Military Affairs and Department of Veterans Affairs. So Chair Newman will be uh, presenting the bill. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Elkins. Okay. Uh, Chair Newton, would you like to uh, uh, move your bill in front of the committee? Yes, I'd like to move uh, House File 1937, Mr. Chair. Okay, and please uh, just present your bill. Uh, this bill is the governor's proposal for the Department of Military Affairs and the uh, National Guard, and I have uh, testifiers from both departments to come up. I don't know uh, which one would like to come first. General Mankey and Don Kerr. Mr. Chair uh, and uh, committee members, my name is Major General Sean Mankey. I'm the Adjutant General of the Minnesota National Guard and the Commissioner of the Director of Military Affairs for Minnesota. With me today, I've got Mr. Don Kerr, the Executive Director of the Department of Military Affairs. And uh, before we get into this testimony, I would just like to offer up to the committee, uh, we plan to send an invitation to the committee uh, to come up to Camp Ripley in June, and we'd be happy to include the museum as part of that orientation day, if we can make that happen. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Kerr, who will walk through the specifics of the uh, budget that we were talking about today for the Department of Military Affairs in the Minnesota National Guard. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Don Kerr. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs. And I think I'm just going to brief from the slides here. I, I do want to tell everybody, uh, fair warning, this is exactly the same presentation that we provided to the committee the last time we were here for our budget proposal. So nothing has changed in here. But I will take you through some of the highlights here mm -hmm. uh, just to make you aware of uh, what the governor's budget proposes for the DMA. Uh, the, and the bottom line is, uh, in the general fund, 26.789 million is what we're currently at, and, and uh, that goes to, I'm sorry, that's it, uh, per year. Uh, with the changes, it brings it up to 29,292 in the first year, and 29,499 in the second year, for a total for the biennium of $58,791,000. And So uh, our appropriations uh, are broken into four major appropriations. The general fund, which is the vast majority of what we get, um, 
in, inside the general fund for appropriations or sub appropriations, the general support account, which funds the normal operations of our agency, the maintenance of military training facilities, which is about $9.8 million currently, and will go to just a little bit more than that in the second year of the biennium upcoming. Our enlistment incentives appropriation this year uh, is at 12.1 million, and that will go up uh, slightly. It looks like a 1.5 million increase, but it's actually a, a half a million dollar a year increase over the current amount uh, because there was a reduction to the base that we're trying to account for. And then we have an unusual appropriation this year. Normally our emergency services appropriation is totally based on a calculation based on previous usage of the National Guard in emergency status. But this year we're asking for some equipment to be purchased out of that fund, specifically radios to communicate with local civil authorities, $500,000 one year and $600,000 the next. Um, the general support appropriation, we pay out of that for the FTEs that support the agency. Uh, some of our uh, the payroll costs, our deployment reintegration activities, uh, our veteran service building rent because we do pay rent to the Department of Administration for our offices in the Capitol complex, phone services, and those types of things that come out of that general fund. The maintenance appropriation, which is $9.8 million in 23, increasing slightly for 24 and 25. Uh, that's what we use to match federal funding to pay the electrical bills, the gas bills, and for maintenance on our facilities in greater Minnesota for routine maintenance activities. So um, some janitorial. We also pay some weird stuff like there are airport joint use agreements that we have with Rochester uh, to allow the 133rd airlift wing to fly touch and goes out of there. We pay them out of this account so that they can get more landings per flight hour rather than flying to Volk Field. Um, and then uh, we also pay the bond for the Minnesota State Armory Building Commission out of this appropriation. So the enlistment incentives appropriation currently 12.1, asking for that to go uh, up a little bit uh, next year. That pays mostly for state tuition reimbursement program, which is a great benefit that we appreciate the legislature providing to the National Guard, gives us a huge competitive advantage. We also pay retention bonuses from that account and also some other special bonuses like a medic bonus that we pay to uh, encourage our medics to maintain their qualifications that improves the readiness of the Minnesota National Guard. Um, the emergency services appropriation, as I mentioned, is typically a calculation, but this particular year, we're asking for some money to replace some outdated radios, and those are in there. Um, the change items inside the general support account, the most significant one is the uh, holistic health and fitness program appropriation. And holistic health and fitness is an Army program to broaden the scope of physical fitness to include wellness, uh, mental wellness, spiritual wellness, in addition to physical wellness and physical performance. And we think this is a very important program because it'll be really significant in maintaining our soldiers' ability to continue to serve when they undergo injuries in the future. And that's what our real focus in it is, is trying to find ways that we can keep soldiers eligible to serve by using physical therapy, uh, a registered dietitian and some other specialists to work those programs to keep soldiers in boots. Uh, this is an Army program, by the way, so uh, very specifically that. Um, additionally, we're asking for increased funding to add a cyber coordination cell, a handful of people to help us do the integration of federal cyber initiatives with state and private cyber initiatives. Uh, it's a very complex area with regard to authorities and limitations, and having a dedicated force to do that we think is critical to being able to protect our networks and also to support the defense of other networks, both private and public in Minnesota. Um, there's a little bit of an appropriation to maintain our current levels of service. That would be an inflationary increase as recommended by Minnesota Management and Budget and some additional funding into the enlistment incentives appropriation as I men measure, uh, mentioned. Um, and I, I guess with that, Mr. Chair, I would stop and see if there are any questions by the members. Oh, uh, Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think this is for General Mankey. Um, with regard to state enlistment and retention bonuses, uh, I'm one of the last individuals who is still grandfathered into the the uh, pension program, and we got this new program. Those soldiers are now getting to the point where their original enlistment time is running out. Are we seeing 
um, them falling off at a at a rate that is more or less than. Um, I see some some reasons why we're increasing it has to do with increased tuition costs, which is you know obvious, and then uh, unanticipated increases in service member participation. Can you explain some about how we're doing? Yeah, so um, you know retention is uh, is critical to the success, excuse me success of the force as well as recruiting. Uh, we've had some hiccups in our recruiting over the last two years with the pandemic and, and other factors and and I think we're getting that back on track now specifically in the retention I would say that uh, you know Minnesota is one of uh, one of if not the only state that offers a state reenlistment bonus so if you reenlist in the Minnesota National Guard for six years you're eligible for a $15,000 bonus which we're seeing is increasing our retention rate um, which is key to the force and, and to keeping a healthy force. Obviously, our people are our most important asset, and if we don't have the people, we can't do our federal mission, our state mission, and our community mis mission. So we're grateful that the legislature was passed last year to allow us to offer this bonus, and I think that's that's where the uptake is a little bit in the funding. But we're seeing... Uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, we can get the numbers back to you as far as the number of members who uh, elected that bonus over the last uh, fiscal year or calendar year ending in 2022. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, sir. Um, just, I think that it's a great, we need to keep an eye on this because, you know, the thing keeping me in the military is the idea that 10 more years from now I'll have a pension. Um, I think that we need to make sure that as we're looking at other soldiers who won't necessarily have, you know, it's not a 20 year thing. It's, it's gradual. I could retire tomorrow and, and cash in something on it. Um, so I appreciate the, the cognizant uh, focus on ensuring that there are reasons why soldiers need to stay in because there's a lot of money that we invest in our soldiers, just sending them to basic training and paying them for that training is expensive. But then you get a 15, 16 year veteran and go and tally up how much money the government has invested in that one human being and it is substantial. And so if everything we can do to keep those soldiers doing the job that we've trained them to do absolutely needs to happen. So thank you, sir. Representative Weems. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and it's for the test, uh, testifier team. Um, and I just want to dig in a little bit on the Minnesota Cyber Coordination Cell. Um, I know that domain has just been growing leaps and bounds, and it's important to keep uh, people in and secure them, uh, as well as you know building these teams. And so having three FTEs. Um, could you describe whether there's, uh, is this strictly a Minnesota team in the sense it's not, ex well, not exportable or, or it's not receiving federal money. This is actually uh, Minnesota appropriations for this team to work with uh, domestic issues here and supporting businesses. Over. So, Representative Beans, uh, Co-Chair, hey, the, this team would be Miltex, <coughs> state Miltex, so they're full-time funded by the state of Minnesota. However, they would be also in the Minnesota National Guard. So they would uh, receive training and whatnot through their federal military occupational skills, but then they would be a state employee, really integrating from what they learn in the federal team. You know, and Minnesota has a cyber protection team sharing those skills across state agencies. And, and a lot of times the conduit of, as far as what's going on at the federal level within DOD, what can be shared with the state and with what can be shared with private partners through that means as well, because right now, we do that, but we're probably not as effective as we could be if we, because they're doing everything else. As you know, um, you know, you, you can't hardly sleep a night without your phone asking you for an update the next morning when you wake up. And you know, we're doing that with our network all the time. So this would be some additional resources strictly to focus more so on the cyber aspect of it and and uh, sharing sharing that uh, information from the federal partners down and then likewise up. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any uh, further questions? Yep. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, I, I guess I do have a question also on the cyber coordination part, uh, funding and so on. So does this include, I know it includes staff or so on, but does it include, um, how do I explain this, like the hard, hardening of electrical components and so on for like a um, electric magnetic pulse type situation is that have anything to do with this or, or technology components uh, mr. chair representative no that wouldn't this this is strictly this has nothing to do with hardware it has everything to do with personnel okay. it has everything to do with policy 
and these would not be people that would come out and save the house's structure from some kind of cyber attack. That's not what they do. Uh, their, their role is to make sure that they're coordinating policies between other like entities at different echelons of government to ensure that our, our, uh, our interests are being met um, with regard to how those policies roll out. And again, this, it's kind of a, a strange thing because when we say cyber coordination, everybody immediately thinks, oh good, little guys that can come help defend my network. And no, that, <laughs> that's not what they're gonna do. Um, they, they really need to have a, a, a more broad effect of making sure that people in various agencies understand what's coming out. And we have been doing some of this work, utilizing our federal workforce. Um, but one of our challenges is now the wars are over and the federal government is cutting funding. And one of the first places that operators cut funding is from things they don't understand very well. And they don't understand very much about the cyber domain. So they're cutting a lot of our IT support. And IT is not cyber either, just to be clear. But what we were using our IT folks to do, they're no longer going to be available for because they're gonna be tied down doing more IT stuff than they used to have to do because we have fewer of them to do it on the federal side. We also think that adding the state component to this really ensures that the state's interests are being looked after. It, it means a lot when a, a military member knows they're working for the state today uh, and not for the feds, that they will definitely do a better job defending the state's interests where there could be conflict between the state and federal government with regard to what's the best thing to do. Okay. Uh, Chair Liss Lagarde. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And th I'm gonna digress a little bit because it's not in the budget though, but um, I, I do wanna ask you since I have you both here about the, uh, the 148th and the hangars. Um, and so I have concern that, um, you know, the state of Minnesota, if we do not make this investment, that we're gonna lose opportunity um, long term. And uh, in, a, in this investment, I believe that it's gonna also, does it get any federal matching uh, or there's no federal matching for the hangers? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Lissigard, there there is no federal matching for the hanger request because from the federal government's perspective, there is no requirement to have the hangers. And this is important because they're going to tell us now that there's no requirement, but then they're gonna come back and evaluate the status of the 148th and say, well, you don't have any hangers. <laughs> and then hold that against us. So um, again, th this whole movement to get the hangers at the 148th strictly as a state function is the product of a visit that the leadership of the Military Affairs Committee in Duluth, City of Duluth, not us, City of Duluth, went and met with the Secretary of the Air Force. And at the time, the Secretary of the Air Force said, hey, if you really wanna be competitive for future fighters to replace the, the F-16s at the 148th, then the state should throw in some, some dollars and show your level of commitment by making these investments. And so we, we worked with the wing to determine what might the best type of investment be and universal aircraft hangars is what popped out of the end of the, of the funnel in the plan shot that, I don't know if you were there at that time, Representative Veens or not, but that we put a lot of energy into how exactly can we do this because there, there are limitations on what we need to buy, what we can buy, and the hangars do appear to be something that we think is an important investment to show good faith on the part of the state of Minnesota to keep that incredibly important resource in Minnesota uh, long into the future. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I threw a softball and boy, did you hit it out of the park. Uh, and I appreciate that because we need to highlight this. And so there is no um, federal matching, but it is our opportunity to make this investment. And my fear is, is that if we don't take this step and we lose that opportunity, we lose um, our security, right? And so we just seen what the 148th did um, just uh, a few weeks ago and at, at the level that, it, that it drew attention. And so um, that's my little plug for uh, uh, a project and I encourage everybody to sign on, um, but thank you for your words. So it's very, very important that we do make this investment. Great, thank you. Are, are there any other questions for these testifiers? If not, our next testifier is Mr. Ben Johnson, the Chief of Staff for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs.
Thank you, Mr. Johnson. If you can uh, introduce yourself and your colleague for the record. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Chair, members. My name is Ben Johnson. I'm the Legislative Director for the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Okay. Um, David Belfi has been, uh, we, we pulled him out of education and employment from the agency, and he is now the permanent senior admin officer, chief of staff for the agency. Um, so I'm back to exclusively legislative activities. Uh, with me this afternoon is Andrew Jarvis. He's our director for veterans programs and memorial affairs. There's a number of items in our budget that are specific to veterans homelessness and our cemetery operations. So I wanted to bring the subject matter expert with me today. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't say uh, greetings from Commissioner Herkey. He is uh, home ill, recovering. He really wanted to be here today. Hello, Commissioner. I'm sure you're watching <laughs> from home. Yeah. Um, but uh, I am an adequate substitute, I hope. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, members, Chair, I will follow suit. I will not do a presentation from a laptop. Uh, ours has not changed either. Um, so the, the printouts, I'll, I'll save a few trees, and the printouts from the last go round uh, will still be accurate. Um, I did want to start real quickly with just a, a review of what's included. Um, what we showed you looks a little bit different from the actual House File 1937 in that ours was laid out in order of priority. Uh, that does not mean that item 13 is, is uh, something that we're willing to sacrifice. It simply means that in order of priority, we would really like to focus on 1 through 13 in that order. Um, quick overview again for the agency. Uh, we're divided into programs and services and veterans health care, which is our veterans homes primarily. Uh, programs and Services has a base budget for FY24-25 of uh, 48380000 um, That is further divided into the operating budget for the uh, Programs and Services side, $34.8 million. Uh, veterans State Cemeteries is uh, $5 million. The Veterans Homelessness Initiative is $7.9 million. And our grants, these are passed through grants to nonprofits at, at uh, $550,000. That is the existing base budget for the Programs and Services side of the House. Our veterans health care, the base budget for FY24-25 is a total of $140 million. Again, that's $124 million in operational budget for the existing uh, five veterans homes. Uh, $15 million in the base is $7.5 million per year for the three new homes that are coming online. Again, a reminder that we'll be opening them this summer. Um, by, uh, Bemidji, Montevideo, and Preston are the three locations for the new homes. And then our <coughs> suicide prevention initiative is currently funded at five point or five and a half. 550,000 per year, 1.1 million for the biennium. So our total base budget coming into this session is $188.5 million. That's for both programs and services and our veterans health care initiatives. Uh, the governor's recommendations, uh, again, um, priority number one is the establishment, operating, and, and operation of the three new veterans homes that I just mentioned. Uh, the general fund increase, uh, 5.5 million in FY24 and 14.5 in FY25. Um, basically, this is hiring and training all the new staff. So we'll start with 20 residents once they're open, get our, our certifications done, and then ramp up as we're able. But we'll, while we're ramping up for our residents, we'll also be ramping up staff. At present, we have all three veterans homes administrators for the new locations are have been hired. Our directors of nursing are, are all either hired or onboarding. Um, and we've now progressed to the next level, which is our maintenance facility supervisors and the like. So start at the top and work our way down getting ready for late summer um, ribbon cuttings, which you are all invited to attend. Um, I won't offer to fly them on a Chinook, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the the budget there, again, is, is really just to get these new homes started up and get them operating, get them serving those new communities so that we have that broad coverage across the state of Minnesota. Uh, would you like to do questions while we go or wait till the answer? Uh, uh, I apologize, Chair. <laughs> That's fine. Um, I think we can, are, are there any questions at this point? You can continue. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, second uh, priority here is, uh, we, we're describing as maintain current service levels. Um, this is a general fund increase for our operational budgets, 14.69 million in FY21, 18.53 in FY, FY25, 24-25. This is an area where we haven't seen as many increases in the past couple of years. We've been told to, to fund at the lowest possible levels to maintain our service uh, over the COVID period and just prior. Uh, the budgets were not as uh, generous as they potentially could be this year. Um, so what we're trying to do is make up ground. We have had four years of pretty steady uh, maintenance, barely making up for the inflation in those four years. Uh, but we've seen continued increases in um, compensation and non-salary costs each year. Uh, minute technology costs continue to increase. and. Uh, Quite frankly, um, the, COVID, uh, the COVID pandemic has reduced our census in the veterans' homes, which has redu reduced our revenues. 
Um, so smaller census means fewer bed days of care, uh, which means uh, less revenue from the federal VA in terms of reimbursement for that care. Um, if we're able to secure this, uh, could secure this general fund increase, we would be able to continue to fund the approximately 146 staff that would fall off of our uh, roster if we don't have it. So uh, con consider it like this, 14.69 in FY24, 18.53 in FY25 means we continue to, to retain the 146, approximately 146 staff in our veterans homes and programs and services. Uh, third priority, um, would you like me to just give you the brief? You could go ahead. Okay. Um, so third priority is our veterans, our homeless veterans and SOAR programs. These are two distinct programs within uh, veterans programs, which is uh, Director Jarvis's area of expertise. The goal here is an increase of 1.4 million each year for the Homeless Veterans Registry, Homeless Veterans Program, and to assist veterans, former service members, and their dependents with attaining federal benefits. That's the SOAR program. Uh, this is this is a request for permanent funding, uh, and the goal again is is the first of our initiatives to to identify preventing and ending veterans homelessness. Uh, the SOAR program is an important resource, and we are currently funding that SOAR program through the SSAP, which is an established, I think we're celebrating 100 years? 100 years, yeah. 100 years of the State Soldiers Assistance Fund this year. Um, but that is an area that we've been utilizing to fund all the new initiatives that we have before us. So uh, this request would permanently fund the Homeless Veterans Program and the SOAR program within MDVA. Uh, another area that uh, Director Jarvis oversees is our Memorial Affairs team. Our fourth priority for the agency, uh, the governor's recommending an increase of 1.78 million in FY24 and 1.78 in FY25 for the veterans cemeteries. Uh, I, I think it's important to point out, and this is in the packets as well, operational costs are 57% higher than our appropriation. So we're currently operating, I wouldn't say shoestring budget, but we're certainly operating uh, in the margins as it were. Um, and this request would bring base funding up to the required levels for support salary and operational costs. And I think critical here is an area, uh, the, um, the cemetery maintenance development accounts, which is where we are funding a lot, of our, um, a lot of our operational costs right now. We would be able to then revert to using those to other ongoing costs. Um, the cemetery maintenance development account is a critical area for, for materials, uh, site operations, facilities and equipment, um, areas that uh, are currently uh, underfunded because we're utilizing that fund to take care of our operations. Um, I also want to point out again, we've got a specific uh, request that's been funded. Uh, we are opening a, a brand new cemetery in Redwood County this fall. We will be doing a dedication ceremony, another another um, commitment to invite all of you, another, uh, we could maybe find a bus. This, that one, I think, yeah. All right, all right. <laughs> again, um, but we're excited about that. So three new cemetery, or three new veterans homes and a cemetery coming online this year. Uh, there's a lot of additional need for, for operations there, but we're really excited if you look at a map of where M MDVA is in the state. Uh, we are kind of everywhere, and that's important because the 300,000 veterans that uh, Mr. Dietrich was referencing earlier, they do live in, across the entire state of Minnesota, and so it's important that we have resources available all over. Uh, our, our fifth priority is, is support for the Minnesota Assistance Council for Veterans with supporting, supportive housing grant funding. Uh, this is a general fund increase of 7.9 in FY24, but then only 750,000 in FY25 and thereafter. Uh, this helps create permanent supportive housing units for homeless veterans. Uh, these are additional units that we have identified as a, as a specific need. Uh, identifying uh, and developing permanent supportive housing units is, is the best way we have found to, to, find, to uh, secure housing for our high barrier veterans, those with the biggest challenges associated with finding housing. Um, so this, this is again a 7.9 million in FY24, um, but that's, that's an area where once we've, uh, once we've secured that um, permanent supportive housing, uh, we are then in a position to really bring an end to, uh, to veterans homelessness in Hennepin and Ramsey counties, which are our two uh, counties with the biggest challenges at this time. Our sixth priority is, is really a carryover request. There is no additional general fund uh, increase associated with this, but we're looking to expend, uh, extend our spending authority for the MinVest program. This is vouchers and supportive services. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time getting this program up and running from when the initial appropriation was offered until the RFP was completed. And so we really have a lag in, in, in spending. We believe we're in a position now where we could roll, if we could roll that money over into FY24, 
we would then be able to expand it and, and use it in the way that was uh, the last legislature identified as a priority. Um, so again, no additional general fund increase here, just uh, authority to spend that money. So you'll see a note in this, um, in the, uh, the staff's uh, research um, talking about $3 million. That's an identified amount that for budgeting purposes um, that, that fluctuates here and there. But the goal is to pull that out of the FY23 uh, budget, roll it into FY24 so that we can utilize it. Priority seven is direct veterans assistance. Um, again, this is another area for identif identified to support ending veterans homelessness. Um, one of the reasons we were looking for this amount is this is $530,000 in FY24 and again in FY25. Uh, this provides prevention resources, which is critical to ending veterans homelessness. It's not simply that we have identified homeless veterans and are working to get them housed. This is going upstream. This is an opportunity to get in front of that problem. Uh, because as uh, Paul Williams, who's on the team, has said to me earlier today, uh, this is an area where if we, it, as soon as they become homeless, that's one additional barrier that makes it even more difficult to get secure and supportive housing, secure and stable <laughs> housing, because it's another ding on the record. If we can keep them out of that, if we can find an opportunity to prevent them from, from homelessness, that that's, improves the long-term outcomes for, uh, for those facing uh, potential homelessness. Uh, again, this is pursuing Minnesota's goal of being the fourth state to declare an end to veterans homelessness. Uh, a new area that the agency is seeking support for is called the Veterans Community Health Program. Uh, this is a general fund uh, increase of 658 in FY24 and then 633 in FY25. This is sal salaries and operating expenses. And, and this program is new to the agency. Uh, we currently have a veteran suicide prevention initiative. We've got two FTEs in that office right now. Uh, what we're looking to do is go beyond that and establish a statewide community-based veteran and family outreach program. Uh, this is one of those areas where there are, not all veterans are in the VA healthcare system, not, not all are eligible for VA healthcare. This is an opportunity for us to get out there and into the community, have uh, clinical social workers and a director working to bridge that gap, find opportunities for people that are getting into the, the non-VA medical system and find ways, again, to get upstream both for uh, caregiver support, uh, but also veteran suicide prevention efforts. Uh, it's a new area. Um, we've seen it um, demonstrated at uh, Regents Hospital has a, a navigator that has demonstrated some success. We think we could go further than that. So we're asking for your support uh, in this area. It would be a total of eight additional FTEs, one in the first year uh, as a director, plus three clinical social workers, and then we would add on as we demonstrate success. Ninth priority is the Service Corps program. Again, um, we're looking for dedicated funding. Uh, this has not, uh, this appropriation has not increased, um, has not increased since 2000, was it 18? We had an increase? Um, yeah, coming in. The fiscal year 20. Into, into fiscal year 20. So the, in, in FY19, we requested and secured an increase to the core program. Again, core is case outreach and management. Uh, we contract with Lutheran Social Services. This is, a, a, again, a statewide program. LSS offers a lot of support statewide. Um, and we have, not, um, we have not kept pace with contracted costs because there is a significant increase in demand. Uh, any specific questions on this one, um, I would say uh, this is an area that, add, that adds a lot of value to veterans throughout the state. It's not just uh, through, um, through LSS. In the metro area, you've heard sometimes there are concerns about are we just serving veterans in the in the Twin Cities metro area, Seven County. LSS has uh, has up resources all across the state, and it's a really good way to add uh, value. Um, and this is again an RFP working with Luther Lutheran Social Services, and they have a demonstrated history of success. So we're seeking an increase there as well. Yeah, Mr. Johnson, I, I met with Luth Lutheran Social Services in my office this morning, and they discussed this program. <laughs> Exceptional. I'm mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Uh, tenth priority here is LinkFet. For those of you who are not aware, LinkFet is a, a, a call center operation. We have in the past worked with um, Minnesota State Colleges, no, M State, right? Um, M State, and it's a call center that really does answer answer the phone seven days a week. Um, and it is a it's a clearinghouse of information. They have a, a really good list of resources. I got the chance to go up to Bemidji, um, and and. Is that Bemidji? We did the walkthrough of the FAQs. Detroit Lakes. Detroit Lakes. I apologize. Mm -hmm. I get I get out of my comfort zone north of uh, St. Cloud. I'm used to <laughs> southern Minnesota. I apologize. Um, 
the, we, we did an FAQ walkthrough with the staff and, and made sure that everything was up to date, that the links worked and that there was an opportunity where someone calls LinkVet or accesses it online, they have a resource for them, for them to, um, to say, hey, where do I find this kind of support? Where do I get a hold of, um, where do I get a hold of a homelessness uh, prevention program coordinator? How do I talk to someone about suicide? Um, how, do, how do I talk to a family member about suicide? The link vet is a, an essential component to our outreach program. Um, the challenge is here that uh, we have, a, I think, a 280000 per year budget. There's a significant gap in what we have and what we, would, what we utilize. Um, so this, the increase here is that um, we also don't have staff. Uh, we also are not funding staff for this out of our agency budget, uh, out of the SOT appropriation. It is, um, it is again, through uh, support our troops and we would rather not utilize that as a resource. Um, that comes up frequently as, why don't you just use the support our troops account to take care of some of these uh, special <coughs> programs. Um, and we really like to reserve the support our troops account for competitive grants or grants to veteran service organizations. It's one of those areas where people with good ideas that can't get in front of the legislature uh, can bring it to a competitive process. Um, again, this is sort of a precursor to, if you hear someone say, just use the SOT account for that, um, we have a dedicated program for the SOT. We'd rather fund LinkVet out of the general fund and get, let SOT be a competitive process for <coughs> the community to bring ideas forward. Um, I got on a tangent there, I apologize, but um, the, the uh, LinkVet program has been pretty st uh, static in its operational funding, and so this is an area we'd like to see some support for increase. Another one that I, uh, that I testified to a few weeks back, um, we're looking for a, an increase in funding, uh, additional funding for the post 9-11 service bonus. Um, Representative Coulter, I owed you a response to the minute request on and why, why an increase. Uh, I was informed that that is an accurate fiscal note for the post 9-11 service bonus and that they, with new additional el eligibility requirements and additional funding, minute would have to do trial runs. And so part of the process is actually doing that homework I'm making sure that it works as soon as we go live. That uh, that people are that we're confident that people will get where they need to go. So, uh, I apologize that it took me two weeks to get to the answer, but numbers, there you go. Um, so the, the the increase here is also to uh, to cover all Minnesota veterans who served post 9/11, not just those who started their service here, uh, and also to add inherent resolve. Again, this is something that I testified on uh, a couple of times now making sure that those who receive the Inherent Resolve Campaign Medal are also covered. Um, make sure that we take care of anyone who is living in Minnesota who has, uh, who has earned that eligibility for a bonus. Only two to go, I've, I'm, it's getting there, I know. Um, the recently <coughs> separated veterans program, um, this is actually an amalgamation of a lot of different areas. Um, this is something that uh, we, we in the agency have been utilizing uh, I think those who are, have served are under, or have been in this committee a little bit understand what a DD-214 is. Um, the veteran verifications are changing. DD-214s will still exist, but most, uh, most uh, verifications are changing to digital systems. Uh, so for instance, a, veterans, uh, a recently separated veteran uh, who doesn't have copies of their uh, hard paperwork, um, it's the, what is, it, is it DOD and VA are making it some, some difficult for us to track make sure that everyone who gets out of the service knows what they're eligible for. Um, so this uh, 402,000 FY24 and 327,000 each subsequent year is to operate this recently separated veterans program. Again, a lot of our programs are currently operating um, piecemeal and this would bring them all under one roof and make sure we have the dedicated staff to keep tracking all the different ways that we can help veterans recently separated from service. And last but certainly not least, is the uh, Minnesota GI Bill funding change. Um, this is an area I've been working with on trying to figure out how best to serve. Um, serve veterans who are seeking higher education. Uh, the goal here is to increase the, uh, this is an annual appropriation again, but the, the goal is to increase the lifetime benefit from, from 10 to $15,000. Uh, some would like to go as far as 20. Uh, currently we're at 15, we're working on that additional five because we are looking to double the amount annually available, three to 6,000. Um, again, the Minnesota GI Bill is established in 2007 and the annual and lifetime amounts haven't changed since then. Uh, we really think this is a good opportunity to serve more veterans, help them avoid student loan debt. Um, and another area is to add some parity because currently a part-time student is only eligible for $500 a year. We think they should be eligible for the full amount regardless. Um, 
I'm, I'm even boring myself. I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to answer any questions. I'll do my best to answer them. If I, if I cannot, I'll defer to uh, Director Jarvis. Yeah, um, Mr. Johns, I've, I've got a question for yes. you. Yeah. So um, I, one thing I don't see in here is funding to renovate the Building 6 at the Minneapolis Veterans Home. I understand we've got long waiting list at that particular <laughs> facility, and it seems like that would be a, a fairly easy to increase the capacity at that home. Chair, thank you for the question. Um, within the within the budget uh, for the agency, we would be seeking investment in in facilities through the bonding bill rather than general fund. The the governor's direction has been to seek improvements there. Um, we've prioritized Hastings and then asset preservation, uh, but we certainly would welcome support from members of the committee for uh, for bond and capital investment um, or general fund cash. Although I don't know what the targets are looking like yet, but we certainly appreciate that and um, we're we're definitely pursuing it. Thank you, Chair. Great, thank you. Uh, other questions from members? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and I really appreciate that. Um, we actually have a bill, um, and I think it'll be both um, uh, in veterans and in bonding for um, Building 6. I know I've been working with your team on that, so looking forward to, thank you, Chair Elkins, for uh, bringing it up and looking forward to working on it. Mr. Chair, if I may, <coughs> Building 6, for all the people on the committee, was formerly the home that we used uh, for for our veterans and when we built the new facility they were moved out of building six into the new home <clears throat> and one of the unfortunate things is in in the metropolitan area we have a, a 36 month waiting list for veterans and spouses to get into and this is a critical care home so if you can imagine having a, a relative or someone that needs critical care in a nursing facility and they're on a 36 month waiting list, they're dying before they get in. So this is really important and Representative Greenman is uh, carrying two bills. One, one will be direct funding and the other will be for, uh, for bonding up to 51 million, I think, to, to do the full job. Mm -hmm. But we really have to take care of the veterans in these homes. The other homes are working well. Waiting list runs maybe two months, three months at most. Generally speaking, uh, you're the Duncan? experts. So. I, mm -hmm. uh, chair, chair, um, no, the the times wait times vary. Yes, two to three months. I think uh, in Greater Minnesota, we're not at 36 months at at Minneapolis. It's closer to 18. Uh, but we've got the active for and inactive veterans, list yeah. for veterans and spouses. Uh, we've had a challenge in in restaff uh, in with staffing as a result of COVID. And we've also had some challenges then with the waiting list being long, elongated because of that. So fewer staff means uh, fewer opportunities for intake. Uh, we do have goals in place and are, are working each month to add, add more than we lose. Um, and, and one quick correction for the record, that the total cost of the Minneapolis project is upwards of 50. The state's 35% that we're looking for is uh, 18 plus million. So, um, so we're still interested in getting federal support for funding for any of the construction projects. Um, and I, we, I think we have an updated number uh, for Representative Greenman. Mm -hmm. Representative Greenman, did you have a follow-up question? Mm -hmm. You got it. Okay, you, we're sir. good. Any other questions? Okay, is there anyone else who would like to testify on this bill? Oh, Representative Weems. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, thank you for this. And I know priorities are always difficult uh, to do. You have to have some evaluative criteria. And you've chosen homelessness over uh, suicide prevention. Um, and I know in the mental health side, early intervention is probably the, the key marker for helping people out. So I think in, in some ways, you know, you're, you're, you're dealing with the devil on the details here. And, you're, and it looks with all the variety of programs um, that you're requesting extra funding for. And I think by your own statements, you, you're, you want to get to what I think uh, Commissioner Herkey said as either net zero or your desired end state of stopping veteran homelessness in Minnesota. And if you could tell us again what that desired end state is or what is net zero for veteran homeless, what does that look like uh, in Minnesota? If I may, Johnson? I would like to defer to the director. This is this was definitely up his alley. Thank you for the question. Yep. Mr. Chair, Representative Weens. So the term we use is functional zero. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're seeking a, a federal declaration from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness, and when the the various metrics. Um, 
show that we've attained functional zero, that's when we get a successful declaration. And functional zero doesn't mean that we won't have homeless individuals, homeless veterans um, in our various continuums of, of care, but it means that uh, those who become homeless, their experience with homelessness will be uh, rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. So it means that we have the, the systems and programs in place to rapidly rehouse an individual to support their episode of homelessness, get them into permanent housing, and to support them um, uh, for as long as it, they may need to maintain that permanent housing. And some individuals re require years of support, while others maybe only need six months of support and uh, maybe finding a, a new job that gives them a, a higher income where they can sustain. And then once that support has been achieved, uh, they don't need additional supportive services. So functional zero is where our systems in place um, have achieved that. And we've made a lot of improvements over the years in those systems and um, w the package and, and requests that we have here is really to help those hardest to house those with the most extreme barriers and mr. chair uh, in, in is there a number associated how do you know that you've a achieved functional zero Mr. Chair, or Representative Weens, yes, so there's uh, I think about seven different U.S. Interagency Council uh, measures. Uh, some of them are uh, the number of chronic uh, homeless individuals, uh, the number of uh, individuals in uh, uh, temporary housing, transitional housing versus permanent housing, the number of days it takes to house an individual. Um, those are just some of the, the measures, but those are all criteria that we look at. So our Homeless Veterans Registry uh, measures all of those uh, items for the individuals. And then when we're looking at a, a COC, in this case, the only two COCs left are Hennepin and Ramsey, um, we're constantly evaluating the metrics in those communities. And and then uh, when we believe we're getting close, we'll do deep dives where our team uh, goes in with the COC teams and looks at all of their uh, information. The qualitative stuff is, is really easy to assess because you know we have it on a SharePoint list and you can easily run numbers. Um, but where the, the time comes in is the, the quantitative um, or, or the qualitative piece. The quantitative piece is easy. Um, so when we're really looking at the systems and, and, and verbalizing how uh, the various housing uh, shelters, transitional housing, permanent housing programs are set up and, and how they can support someone so uh, that it is rare, brief, and non-reoccurring. And that takes a little bit of time. I think the V-Show program, which was partially funded last session, um, has been the biggest success in getting us to advance uh, permanent housing for veterans because of just how the housing market and rental market is uh, these days. Mr. Chair, if I can make just one final cl uh, yeah. closing comment. Uh, thank you, and I, I hope the best for this full court press on veterans homelessness. I would like to sit down maybe with yourself or the commissioner and, and dive in, not that I wanna really get into the numbers, but uh, I think this is gonna be a good news story for us. Um, I think sometimes with good news stories, um, people want to come to Minnesota because uh, and they're, they're maybe not from Minnesota because of how we treat people and how we get things right and I think it will have an impact on uh, the uh, suicide ideations and those kind of things so I think it, it's maybe a double whammy kind of thing where you can do it and being set up to be able to to tell that story and to execute it uh, I look forward to hearing back from you later thank you any further questions? Are there any uh, further testifiers for the bill? Seeing none, uh, Chair Newman, would you like to uh, issue some closing comments? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and we'll be continuing working on this bill. We're gonna lay it over, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I hope to work with committee members on particular bills that you've had that really aren't fully funded in, in this uh, legislation. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to um, renew my motion on House File 1937, but that it be laid over for uh, further consideration. The bill is laid over. Okay. Um, with that, I, having no further business to come before us, we're adjourned. The next meeting will be on Monday, March 6th. Yeah. And